Um, I'm Neil Brenner, professor of urban theory here at the GSD, and thank you for coming on this somewhat gloomy Saturday morning. It's kind of a nice day to sort of curl up into a conference room. If you're wondering what this is, this is a picture of the uh, chalkboard in my seminar from a couple of weeks ago. So some of the participants in my seminar will recognize that we've been documenting our sort of brainstorming efforts. So um, Moisen asked me to make some opening remarks. Um, <clears throat> we had some very challenging opening theoretical forays last night by Saskia and by Homi. And we have a very wide-ranging agenda today. And I, I view myself as kind of the warm-up band. So I'm kind of doing a little warm-up, just trying to get everybody in the state of mind to think about some of these questions about the urban and the political. Um, and my goal in these opening remarks is basically less to make a specific argument of my own than to kind of put the conference agenda in a broader historical and theoretical context through a couple of broad arguments and hypotheses. So there are a lot of themes, it seems to me, on <clears throat> the agenda today. The spatialities of democracy, the state, sovereignty, territory, the question of new political spaces, the question of the city, the urban, urbanization processes, the production and reworking of the built environment at various scales from the neighborhood to the city to the nation and actually all the way up to the globe because I think for us the built environment is also global, it's not only local. And uh, social and political struggles within the built environment and to transform the built environment. So it's a pretty wide ranging um, kind of uh, set of issues. and. Uh, what I want to do is kind of embed our investigation and our debate about these issues in relation to, first of all, um, the kind of inheritance from political theory uh, that we have in terms of thinking about democracy and liberal democracy and its spatial assumptions. So I'm going to start with a somewhat broad sketch of the ways in which the spatialities of democracy are generally understood within liberal uh, political theory. And then I'll move towards thinking about bringing the urban into that particular problematique. So <clears throat> um, arguably all of political theory, all of state theory is filled with geographical assumptions. There are all kinds of spatial assumptions that are presupposed in any kind of discussion of politics in the state and democracy no matter what the tradition. And John Agnew, a geographer, summarizes this very well. He's engaged in a critique of international relations theory, but the same thing I think applies to what we're trying to do here. What John Agnew says is that an argument can be made that social science has been too geographical and not sufficiently historical in the sense that geographical assumptions have trapped consideration of social and political economic processes in geographic structures that defy historic change. So the point here is that traditionally the way that democracy and politics and the state have been understood is within the parameters of, of a kind of underlying structure of the state and territory. And Homi last night referred to that, I think, very appropriately as a kind of Westphalian model of state and of space. So what is that? And by the way, before I unpack that, a kind of footnote, in kind of historical international relations and historical sociology, the notion of a Westphalian model has actually been called into question in terms of whether that generalization actually applies to the formations of the political that exist, have existed since 1648. But for present purposes, I'll use it just as a heuristic insofar as that model has been presupposed analytically within political theory, it, it represents a useful counterpoint for what we're trying to do today. So what are these spatialities of Westphalian democracy? Um, <clears throat> so a lot of IR theorists have made this kind of argument about Westphalia, a few of the authors I've listed. And the basic idea is the idea of nationally organized political systems with a national scale as the privileged scale of the political and of the demos. Um, the notion of territorial sovereignty, politics conceived within each territory as a kind of aerial co-presence of competing social forces that are all, as it were, embedded within a shared container of politics. So they might contest different issues within that container, but the container frames the political through a kind of space-time of co-presence. It's a shared assumption within diverse approaches. And democratic politics within this kind of Westphalian, nationally territorialized, state-centric framework is understood as a relationship 
between a nationally constituted people, a nationally constituted demos, and an institutionally differentiated state apparatus, so executive, juridical, executive, and so forth. So those are kind of working assumptions. There are many debates, of course, within liberal political theory and liberal democratic theory, but these kinds of geographic assumptions are largely shared. Oh, and finally, the, the notion that um, democracy may evolve historically, but it's basically contained within this kind of broader historical territorial framework. So there are many different struggles, obviously, revolutionary, counter-revolutionary, Saskia's ideas about territory, authority, and rights. Within this Westphalian model, they evolve, but the container remains basically fixed. So that's the kind of John Agnew argument about the geography is there, but it's conceived as being more or less outside of time, outside of historical evolution. So there are obviously some other political imaginaries even within the Westphalian system. So we don't want to totally reify this, and I just came up with a few. One would be um, anarchist or socialist localisms and regionalisms, place-based militant particularisms. So I was thinking of Eve Blau's work on Red Vienna, sort of the local as a scale for an alternative politics. Um, empire, so notions of imperialism, whether via Lenin or Carl Schmitt, obviously a very different scale than the national. And finally, internationalism, so Marxist internationalisms and anti-colonial, kind of post-colonial Bandung-style internationalisms. So there are many scales, but even still, I would argue that these models of the political continue basically to conceive the political and territorial terms. So as a kind of aerial co-presence of the demos and of a territorial sovereign, it's simply downscaled or upscaled. So that's kind of, you know, very broad sketch of a huge problematique, but it seems to me it provides a counterpoint for thinking about the political and politics against which we can start to think about some of the agendas of this conference. So contemporary challenges, and again, I'm being very broad and general here, but just as a kind of framing device, I think many of us in the room would argue that contemporary moment of capitalism, statehood, and political struggle involves major changes, major transformations in the world, and that those are generating new formations of politics and political struggle. So Henri Lefebvre, who's one of my kind of inspirations for thinking about these things, encapsulates the problem quite well. This is from many years ago. He says, we find ourselves faced with an extraordinary little known phenomenon, the explosion of spaces. Neither capitalism nor the state can maintain the chaotic, contradictory space they have produced. So these inherited spatialities are more or less being exploded. They're being reworked in patterned, but also quite confusing ways. So what are some of these explosions? And here I'm just kind of reminding folks of, I think, literatures that are quite well known to people in the room. Certainly, um, the reconfiguration of national economies, processes of geoeconomic integration, and hyper-financialization have, have transformed the locus of the political, and many in the room have investigated that. The production of what I've called new state spaces, so the spatial reorganization of the state, including the national state, through rescaling, re-territorialization, or what Bob Jessup has called destatization, the proliferation of new governance mechanisms. So the national remains important, but it's remade within a multi-scaled, re-territorialized geopolitical context. New topographies of capital, commodities, and labor in the world economy, so increasingly spatial metaphors of flow and network are superimposed upon the inherited formations of territory and place through which we've traditionally imagined the political. And then new patterns of marginalization and polarization at all spatial scales. So this is a deeply uneven formation of capital and the political. The earlier Westphalian formation was also deeply political, but we're seeing that unevenness assume new geographic forms which in turn pose new intellectual and political challenges for us. So all of this, I mean, there are many different questions one can pose about this new formation of the world and of urbanization, but all of this arguably entails major questions of regulation and major political questions. Um, questions about democratic empowerment are exploding across territories, across sites, across scales and spaces, new political spaces, and new spatialities of democracy are emerging. And it seems to me that is part of what we're trying to deal with in this conference. But we're dealing with it 
given that we are a school that's focused on the study of the built environment, we're dealing with this through a different lens than the lens that I've been sort of reviewing via this historical sociology international relations theory literature. We're dealing with this via the lens of questions about the remaking of urbanization, the remaking of the geographies of the built environment in recent decades. So again, reviewing very rapidly um, literatures which cover a variety of trends entailing transformations of the built environment in different ways, in different contexts, but just for the sake of kind of putting this on the table for debate. Um, inherited forms of cityness are being exploded. So even back in the 1960s, Lewis Mumford complained that the city's legibility was disappearing in the face of a sort of new reconstituted form of urbanity whose contours were increasingly amorphous. And more recently, Frederick Jameson has kind of made the same sort of argument via a kind of critique of postmodern theory. So what is cityness in this new context? The nature of the urban has been reconstituted territorially, upscaled and rescaled outwards. The morphologies of the urban today defy easy categorization. We can no longer use the simple monolithic models of centrality which we inherit from 20th century urban theory. And Lefebvre, Soja, Saskia Sassen, and many others in this room have investigated that. Um, what Stephen Graham has called the splintering of the urban fabric. So there are new types of connectivities that are emerging between different zones of urban space, both within and among major urban regions. This is, of course, one of Saskia's major research um, themes, coupled with new forms of polarization and inequality and marginalization. Again, something that many in the room, including Saskia, Loic, Vacant, and others have investigated. So again, this deeply uneven landscape is not only uneven economically, but it's unevenly articulated in the built environment. So, and a concern of mine, which I would like to put on the table, connecting to all of these, is that urbanization is increasingly generalized. It's increasingly planetary. The boundaries between the city and the non-city, the urban and the non-city, are increasingly complex. So if the city is a site of the political, it's, uh, or the site of new political struggles, it's no longer entirely clear how to localize that, how to bound it, because cityness is, again, in Lefebvre's terms, exploding across the entire landscape. So cities are no longer distinct, if they ever were, from supposed non-city or rural settlement spaces. The urban is transformed into a worldwide condition of the political rather than an isolated settlement space. So in terms of the location of our analysis and our debate in this conference, Yes, we're interested in densely settled, iconic built environments, the big cities of the world. But at the same time, I would open up the question of whether the types of political dynamics and struggles that we're trying to, uh, and transformations of the built environment that we're trying to look at in this conference are indeed specific to these iconic, densely settled landscapes. They may be ricocheting across the landscape of the built environment and that these new interconnectivities pose serious methodological and political challenges for us. So cityness, for me anyway, is an increasingly slippery category. So OK, in the remaining time, um, just a few more remarks about the ways in which this framing of the inherited spatialities of the political via some of the political, economic, and spatial transformations that I've just very briefly outlined might be investigated across the built environment and some of the different conceptual inroads we might adopt for thinking about emergent new political spaces. So this is, this is now a bit sketchy or kind of preliminary or hypothetical. So I'm sort of moving into the kind of sketching on the board of the classroom, of the classroom mode. And see, we'll see if this is helpful. It could, be, um, it could be a dead end. And if it is, then just you can ignore it. Um, but we'll see. So just a few different um, conceptual inroads for thinking about new political spaces. So new localisms and new regionalisms. The city or the urban as a site, as an arena of new political spaces. And last but not least, what I'm particularly interested in, the city or the urban as a stake of new political spaces. And I have this, and I'll explain those in a second. I have this, this distinction. This is a bit, I'm still working this out. But I have this idea that Struggles over new political spaces sometimes involve struggles to appropriate state institutions, to gain state power for particular purposes. But to me, this is analytically distinct from, although it's concretely connected with, struggles for control over the urbanization process itself, over the, the sort of collective means for the production of the built environment. 
I mean, for me, urbanization is basically the collective process of production of the built environment. So on the one hand, the state as a terrain of struggle and as an object of struggle. On the other hand, the urban, not just as a site of struggle, but as an actual stake. In other words, trying to gain control over the collective means for the production and reorganization of the built environment. So just quick illustrations of what I have in mind as a way perhaps to classify different terrains of discussion in this conference. So the new political spaces are kind of all over the place. It's obvious. So first of all, new localisms, new regionalisms. So classic model here is Alan Scott. Some of you will know his work on regions in the world economy. And the basic idea is that in contrast to the Westphalian model of nationally centralized statehood, we're seeing the assertion of new local and regional forms of governance within major urban regions that try to confront some of the governance problems and collective action problems that emerge within the dense um, and economically dynamic kind of globalizing city regions of the world. So Alan Scott and others have tried to analyze the increasing thickening of governance at local and regional scales. So cities and city regions become zones of incredible institutional experimentation and institutional innovation. And this is a major site. I've tried to look at this in some, some of my work as well. It's a major site of political and institutional innovation that is arguably relevant to thinking about the nature of the political in a post-Westphalian, post-Fortis Keynesian moment. So somewhat crudely diagrammed, I view, I mean, again, this is very general, but you can view these projects as really, they're trying to harness state institutions in order to promote new forms of economic governance. I mean, some of these new forms of economic governance are informal, they're, I mean, that's the word governance is often a way of re referring to non-state-based forms of governance. But that's at least one kind of <clears throat> way of demarcating the significance, the analytic significance of such struggles. So secondly, the city and the urban as a site of new political spaces. So the idea here, and um, Saskia spoke about this in detail last night, uh, in restructured and restructuring urban spaces, new political formations emerge along with associated political demands. So the idea here is that the big centers, the big agglomerations are arenas within which a variety of new political claims are being articulated. So new forms of civic participation, for example, as we heard last night among immigrants, new formations of citizenship. People here will know the work of James Holston. So, so the city is a locus for new, new visions, new dreams of belonging in the political and also obviously new geographies as well. Uh, <clears throat> new political identities and subjectivities. Again, I refer to Saskia's work. She's covered many of these themes. And new political strategies. Importantly, they're not only territorially bounded within the city, but they're, again, as Saskia put it last night, transversal. They're networked. They involve new ways of linking together dispersed spaces across scale and place. And the Occupy movement, in some ways, connects with this. And here I'll just liberally quote from one of Saskia's recent papers on the street, which I think really gets at the spirit of how we might think about these new political spaces. Saskia writes, the street is a space where new forms of the social and the political, political can be made rather than a space, and she's contrasting this idea to Max Weber's notion of the city, a, a space for enacting ritualized routines. Today's political practices, I would argue, have to do with the production of presence by those without power a politics that claims right to the city and to the state rather than protection of property. So again, the contrast to Weber, property-based. New forms of the political are being constituted with the city as a key site for this type of political work. The city is in turn partly constituted through these dynamics. Far more so than a peaceful and homogenous suburb, the contested city is where the civic is made. So this is really just very lucidly articulating exactly this point. The city is a site where new conceptions of the civic, of the political, of citizenship, of political belonging are made. Much to be said about this. So because I didn't, don't know if it really fits in, in my scheme, I just drew arrows in every possible direction. Um, but the idea is that it really, um, it, it's definitely about the state, because the state is a means for remaking the institutionalized definition of political. But it's also very much about, as the quotation illustrates, new visions for what the space of belonging actually is, and therefore redefining the geography of the political. And last but not least, I'll conclude with this. Uh, <clears throat> the city and the urban as a stake of new political spaces. <clears throat> so this is complex, and I'm, I'm really kind of all out of ta time already, so I'm just going to summarize it briefly. And this is basically the uh, Lefebvrean idea of the right to the city. 
So the right not only to, um, to struggle for new particular claims within the city, but the emergence, and this is arguably not at all specific to the current moment, but one might argue it's intensifying, the emergence of new types of claims to actually occupy and reorganize the space of the city, the space of the region, the space of the world. So that the object of struggle is now the built environment, control over the production of the built environment. In David Harvey's terms, control over the collective management of surpluses produced under capitalism. So it's, it's connected to each of the other two moments, the production of new institutions, the promotion of new claims within the city, but now the whole thing, as it were, turns back on itself. So it's literally the production of claims and projects which target the built environment at any scale. So it could be the scale of the monument, it could be the scale of the city, it could be the scale of the region, it could be the scale of you know, infrastructure. So in some ways, I mean, just to concretize it and also explode it at the same time, debates on ecological sustainability, which are global, I would argue can be read as debates about how we're going to manage the global built environment, the global commons. So this is, of course, a very Lefebvrean theme. He introduced the notion of the right to the city. And rather than give you the long Lefebvre quote, which may confuse the, the, matters, the matter rather than and clarify it, I'll give you David Harvey, who kind of nails it, I think, pretty well. I mean, again, it's, it's, a, huge, it's a huge debate. Um, to claim the right to the city in the sense I mean it here is to claim some kind of shaping power over the process of urbanization over the way in which our cities are made and remade and to do so in a fundamental and radical way. So control over what? So appropriation and distribution of the surplus, the shape of the city and the city region, the shape of the neighborhood, the shape of the monument, any scale. And also, going back to my theme about the blurring between the urban and the non-urban, the uh, configuration of non-city spaces that are transformed through urbanization. So here the issue of ecological sustainability is illustrative the process of uneven development more generally. So this last moment, the city as a stake shifts. It's certainly not ignoring the state. It's not that such struggles don't need power over the state. I would insist that they do and that they do target the state. But their object is not the state as such. Their object is how to control, how to collectively appropriate or reappropriate um, some kind of control, some kind of structuration some, some kind of ability to structure the process of urban development. So this is, um, oops, wrong way. So this is all very confusing, and I don't really know where to draw these arrows, but the intention is to situate the kind of um, emergent struggles over the urban, over the built environment, within a broader geohistorical, geopolitical context. The Westphalian model that I've sketched very briefly may or may not provide a useful counterpoint for thinking about emergent geographies, emergent strategies. Ultimately, our emphasis is, and, and also, by the way, we may, um, like this is just my list. I imagine we're going to have many other things to add to this list. And it could be that other stakes of struggle and other terrains of struggle may also emerge. But since I'm just the warm-up band, hopefully you're now very nicely warmed up and caffeinated. And I think that what we do is we're not going to discuss, I think we, we don't, I've already gone over time anyway, so we're not going to discuss this directly, take it, bring it back, leave it, no problem. Um, I think now we go directly to the next panel, and I look forward to a very um, stimulating conference. Thank you very much. Morning. My name is Antoine Picon. I'm professor at the GSD. It's a pleasure for me to be moderating this first panel on monuments and memorials. Uh, why monuments and memorial at the beginning of this conference? There are perhaps two ways to understand uh, that. The first probably is this need mentioned by Neil at the beginning of his uh, warm up the need to balance geography with history. So we're going probably to discuss a little bit uh, the relation to history and memory uh, uh, this morning. Probably another way to understand it is among the places of struggle, among the places that are today both deassembled and reassembled, we find definitely collective memory. 
And memorials, as we all know, were never uh, related to something static. Memory was always a project. But it's clear that today, memory more than ever is a disputed, is a fragmented territory. So this is among probably the things we're going to discuss this morning. So we have three wonderful presenters this morning, beginning by that I will introduce very briefly, and then they'll talk each uh, one after the other, and then we'll have hopefully a conversation. Uh, on what has been said. The our first speaker will be Erika Nadizhinsky, who teaches history of architecture uh, at Harvard Graduate School of Design and whose work extensively on European architecture uh, uh, in 18th and um, 19th century, as well as on the relation between public art and the social philosophies of the Enlightenment. Then we'll hear Michael Arad, who is the partner at Handel Architect and the recipient of a Young Architect Award from the American Institute of Architect in 2006, and who is, of course, uh, pretty busy with the World Trade Center uh, site memorial. Uh, and finally, we'll listen to Christoph Vodishko, who is professor also at the Graduate School of Design and who's realized a, a great number of uh, large-scale slide and video projection on architectural facade and monuments, and I'm especially interested in his latest proposal for Paris. So please join me in welcoming the first of all speakers. Thank you. So uh, as we get set up here, um, I just wanted to say thank you to Neil, because he set us up rather spectacularly well. And I think that the talks that we're going to hear this morning speak uh, rather directly to the right to the city, to the way it's uh, galvanized, capitalized, um, uh, especially through monuments and commemorative objects and rituals in city spaces. Um, Uh, my topic takes us to the French Revolution, uh, meaning that I am going to play the role of the historian here rather than mm -hmm. make claim to large uh, geographies. Uh, secondly, um, I'm going to be emphasizing the role of representation in all of this. And thirdly, we're going to turn to a very specific local and iconic site, uh, that is the site of Paris, its public spaces in the 1790s, and its representations of a newly formed body politic, a body politic uh, which really was about trying to attempt to give an image to the citizen, uh, all the while trying to uh, maintain or kind of handle its own ambiguous and evolving definition and representation. The notion of the citizen, of course, stood at the core of events over the course of the 1790s. Thus, citizen le citoyen uh, made manifest some profound ambiguities. Uh, this is an idea we heard eloquently expressed last night, uh, but did so in very complicated circumstances because, in a sense, this was the moment when the citizen was invented, effectively had not um, effectively had not existed as something real, as an image, as a representation before 1789. It had to be invented. It certainly had plenty of social philosophy on which to rely, but its reification was another matter uh, from the moment of 1789 on. So as to set the stage for all of this, I actually want to take my lead from one of art history's founding myths, uh, that is one of the most celebrated works of a Greek painter, Parasius, active in the fourth century BC, who was recorded by Pliny the Elder as having depicted Demos, uh, an allegorical image of the people of Athens. Pliny tells us that Demos, quote, represented and expressed equally all the good as well, as well as all the bad qualities of the Athenians at the same time. One might trace the changeable, the irritable, the kind, the unjust, the vainglorious, the proud, the humble, the fierce, and the timid. 
What this image actually looked like, uh, because of course we don't have the original, was for centuries the subject of speculation in archaeological treatises, including that of the uh, architectural theorist, uh, late 18th century architectural theorist of type and typology, Quatre Mères de Quincy. Uh, Quatre Mères de Quincy came up with what he called a polycephalic monster of democracy by placing multiple expressive heads on the body of Athena's owl of wisdom. Now, I don't have time to properly address this altogether astonishing caricature. My point is simply this, at this juncture, that the French Revolution posed the problem of representing demos, or the collective body of the people as never before. Indeed, the image of demos was propelled into being by the destruction of the divinity of the sovereign. What you see here, the execution of Louis XVI on January 21st, 1793. It took place on a royal square, or what had been a royal square, designed by the architect Jacques Gabriel, um, which was redubbed for the occasion and for its uh, staging of the guillotine, Revolution Square. This is now today Place de la Concorde. Now, notice, for example, the empty pedestal. Get the pointer here. The middle. The empty uh, pedestal. Um, it's, uh, it, it once had supported a bronze royal equestrian statue, and it's as if this image were registering officially sponsored iconoclasm, the highly orchestrated of, uh, destruction of royal effigies a year earlier across the city, as a kind of symbolic redundancy of the death of the king, a kind of repetition compulsion of the sort Homi discussed yesterday. But our point here uh, is that up to this juncture, as the historian Lynn Hunt has proposed, kingship was the sacred center that made possible social and political mapping. It gave the members of its society their sense of place, it was the heart of things, the place where culture, society, and politics came together. As an image of political radical radicalism then, Demos, in its revolutionary guise, emerged to fill the vacuum left behind by this violent demise of kingship, only in turn to inaugurate, and this is Hunt again, quote, a crisis of representation. Demos was nothing if not multivalent, ambiguous, slippery. And in the time that I have, I'd like to offer some reflections, albeit brief and necessarily limited, on how the image of Demos inflected and was inflected by the spaces of the city and the actions that unfolded in them. Let me begin with the so-called third estate, in other words, the 99% as it appeared in old regime France. This is how Abbé Seyès explained the status of that 99% in a pamphlet he published in January 1789, just prior to the uh, convocation of the Estates General. Quote, what is the third estate? Everything. What has it been up until now in the political order? Nothing. What does it want? To become something, end of quote. That something remained utterly obscure for the simple reason that it uh, is generalized by say yes into an abstraction. The third estate, he writes, constitutes the nation. Indeed, being and becoming function very differently in say yes's pamphlet. If the outcome of becoming would remain an abstraction, something called the nation, whatever uh, that was, it's quite clear that the common people of France, what the common people of France are in 1789, what they are is something akin to a beast of burden, which should be freed from the dead weight of the privileged orders, the nobility and the clergy who literally ride on its back. This was a common theme in the caricatures of the period. Here, for example, where the tagline of the image runs, quote, a peasant carrying a, a, a nobleman and a, a member of the clergy, quote, I gotta hope that this game's gonna be over soon, end of quote. 
Interestingly, if logically, the uncertainty of what the third estate would become translated itself into increased pressure to see citizenship in the public sphere, to see the belonging in the political sense, to see uh, the collective body of the people, to make it visible, recognizable, and transparent. This is where the neoclassical and Jacobin painter, Jacques-Louis David, played his role so well as pageant master of the nascent republic, designing everything from clothing for the new citizen to the iconographies of the festivals that ritualized and rescripted the public spaces of Paris. Here, for example, with his design on the left of a functionary and the dress of the citizen on the right, or here with the apogee of the Festival of the Supreme Being in June of 1794, which had been used by Robespierre uh, to inaugurate a kind of new state religion, a sort of deism erected uh, in the name of reason and nature. As is well known, the uncertainty of what the third estate would become was ultimately expressed by the realm of abstractions, by a retinue of allegories, mostly female personifications of concepts like liberty, equality, justice, reason, nature, the motherland. Mostly female personifications, that is, save for the image of demos. For the people, a new and resolutely masculine allegory emerged which was an inversion of what you see on the left, the Gallic Hercules deployed as propaganda by kings such as Henry IV. This new Hercules was a buff demigod, a colossal ideal nude grasping liberty and justice in one hand and his club in the other, a figure most of all whose ambiguous status rested on the fact that he represented strength, impulsive violence, and potentially anger. The figure, in short, was all brawn and no brains, all action and no talk, lacking the capacity for forethought and instead evoking uncontrollable chaos and force. That the violence inevitably lurked at the fringes of this allegory of Demos is wittingly recorded by the French visionary architect Jean-Jacques Lequeux in his proposed Arch of the People, a monumental rusticated gateway over which the colossal Hercules reclines propped up by his club and donning a Phrygian cap crowned by the French rooster. This, as Lequeux scribbled on the page, we think rather desperately, was, quote, a plan to save me from the guillotine, everything for the motherland. Much has been written on the allegory of Hercules and on the ways in which it functioned to signal the anxieties of a nascent political order, claiming its right to exist on the very basis of what apparently it feared most, that is, itself. So let me retain the idea that Hercules was couched in violence, thus underscoring the fact that inventing the image of the people was necessarily a reflection on violence and its representation. For what is most interesting to my mind are the ways in which the allegorical expression of Herculean potency in public space was actually the flip side of urban events and the spaces of public occupation. On the one hand, allegories were deployed in what was officially defined as the roster of new public spaces, Revolution Square, the Pont Neuf, or even the transformation by Quatre Mers of Soufflot's Church of Saint Genevieve into a pantheon for revolutionary martyrs and heroes. This is the transfer of Voltaire's ashes to that building. On the other hand, set against officially identified public spaces were far more liminal urban territories and re-territorializations. How do we read an image like this? What is it representing? And I want to insist on that representational aspect for all of these images are necessarily fictionalizing and manipulating the real. Let's turn to the image. Expeditious means by which to move an aristocrat out of his residence, that's the title, is a small anonymous engraving which appeared in the press, but it holds considerable interest. 
The image establishes clear guidelines for how to orchestrate the sack of an architectural space that under pre-revolutionary conditions would have been deemed both imposing and impregnable. Begin, so the image instructs, by opening a window through which to display the domestic treasures you are about to hurl from the sanctuary of affluence. Bedsheet after bedsheet, a cracked mirror in a gilt frame, or an overstuffed chair waiting to meet its embroidered twin below. It is crucial that the display allow for a brief moment of contemplation, for what thereby gets signaled to the outside world is an internal struggle between a desire to possess and an ethos of refusal. Your companions will accordingly be vulnerable to flashes of indecision. A note of regret in the woman, the young woman on the lower right who fingers the heavy drape, the hats coming off in salute to the portrait of the king's likeness on the second floor, and maybe a tinge of longing for the lady in an oval frame held for the first time at arm's length. While individual encounters with luxury are, successfully cap are successively captured in each window, Ensuing propulsion ensures that the debris from the everyday life of privilege will continue to accumulate in the courtyard. A commode beyond repair, a shattered window, a frying pan, and a right there, an enema syringe, there as indecorous metaphor for purging France of its elite, and thrown in as junk along with the rest, is a single <coughs> bill of paper money absolutely worthless. Readers of Bakhtin will recognize in excremental imagery such as the enema syringe, one of the many explorations in revolutionary caricature of the Rablaisian body and its symbolic purging. Somatic allusions to aristocratic excess or ecclesiastical greed harness such carnivalesque imagery in order to present the French Revolution as the moral corrective to uh, the old regime degeneracy and thereby insert in that same imagery, what Peter Stallybrass and Alan White have called, quote, a generalized economy of transgression and the recoding of high-low relations across the whole social structure. This destruction of valued objects, then, function to subvert ongoing attempts by the government to identify and appraise newly nationalized patrimony, which brings us to think about those apertures Windows, like doors and mirrors, explains Henri Lefebvre, are transitional objects or thresholds bearing a ritual significance. In selecting descriptive terms like transitional and threshold, Lefebvre was speaking to the capacity of architectural openings to breach the physical boundaries they demarcate with frame, sill, ledge, roofline. That is, those architectural openings negotiate exchange between interiority and exteriority by collapsing together different spatialities, bringing the room and the object it contains to the street and vice versa. The concept of ritual adds another more complicated dimension to this ongoing process of two-way transference. For Lefebvre, thresholds can localize sacred precincts, temples or palaces, and by extension, can ident inaugurate life-defining rites of passage. He uses the example of graduating. Thus, his argument seeks to demonstrate how localizations themselves, as they work to produce social spaces, quote, derive not only from ideology, but also the symbolic properties of space, properties inherent to that space's practical education, uh, occupation, excuse me. This inherent hybridity of space, cast in terms of symbolics and practices, brings us back to the window as it figures in the image and the threshold's potential ritual function in social practices more broadly defined. What I mean to suggest, with the help of Lefebvre, is that the image presents us with a whole series of thresholds, of windows or as passageways, the ultimate effect of which is, in, is to insert itself into an ever more far-reaching mode of collective response to the urban surround. The spatial metonymy of dispersion, in other words, is everywhere to be found in revolutionary images of destruction. 
Here, another version of that event titled The Irritated People includes throwing objects out of windows as part of public spectacle. A depiction of the plundering of a monastery takes that sp same spectacle to the street and in this depiction of the Bastille, the piles of debris encircling the building's foundation perceptibly metamorphose with each stone cast from above into uniformly pyramidal and entirely monumental shapes. To be sure, these are all trenchant recapitulation of particular events, but they are also general blueprints for the changing symbolic relation between a certain class of people and certain spaces in the city. By laying bare the mechanisms of propulsion and dispersion, of repetitious, repetitious collective gestures and the activation of the threshold, mm -hmm. these examples attest to the formation of a central visual trope in the representation of destruction, a trope finding a monumental expression in pyramids of debris. Hence, to conclude, the monument's capacity to transform destruction into a kind of revolutionary rite of passage when calling forth for its own commemorative procedures as the following eyewitness account makes clear. Quote, the monument was erected at the entrance of the Abbey of Saint-Denis, the royal necropolis of kings, in the middle of the square. Every patriot was a worker. They made a vertin mountain or triumphant pyramidal allegory to the mountain party Cypresses, pines, lilies, and firs and grass were planted over the debris. The heart of this mountain offers a grotto made from the debris of the tombs of the kings of France. The marble which had once decorated these tombs were brought in great number. The most beautiful materials of this kind were used artlessly by free hands. This bizarre monument, erected to liberty, is perhaps the most philosophical lesson of its kind. We owe this narrative of iconoclasm's final outcome to an official who had gone to Saint-Denis to draw up an inventory of works left behind by the commission responsible for the dismantling of the royal necropolis's tombs. As for the philosophical lesson taught by such a bizarre monument erected in the name of liberty, it was David who had the most to learn from artless hands and the pyramid or mountain they erected with fragments. The lesson was this that the remnants of pillage might, after all, be brought into the realm of public art. Small wonder that when he was commissioned to erect a statue of, Hercule of Hercules, his allegorical image was destined to stand, quote, on the truncated debris of royal statues piled up any which way, end of quote. David goes on, quote, such monuments are worthy of us. Those who have adored liberty have always erected them, they were raised as pyramids, pyramids of stone, pyramids of debris, and they menace foolhardy kings who would dare to violate the land of the free, quote. These are memorable words. David, it seems, had determined that his monument could be made to pick up the pieces so as to order the world anew. Thank you very much. Good to be here. I feel uh, like a patient at a convention of psychiatrists. <laughs> We're about to uh, dissect the meaning of everything I'm about to show. Um, so I was wondering what I was going to be talking about today and uh, how do I tie it to the theme of this conference. And uh, my response uh, and building the 9-11 memorial was very much a product of experiencing the public spaces of New York, of being in the public realm and responding uh, as a citizen, um, which was odd for me because I'd been living in New York for just about two, three years uh, when those events happened and when I witnessed them. And I think it was witnessing them uh, firsthand uh, that changed my relationship to New York, that changed my relationship to, uh, to the place that I was in. Uh, you couldn't have that distance as, um, as a tourist. Uh, you were there 
as a member of that society. For the first time, I felt like a New Yorker, uh, engaged, uh, having a connection to everyone around me. And it was public spaces like Union Square and Washington Square where I think uh, I was so um, struck by the response of uh, people to what happened. It was not so much the violence of that day as the response to it and the days and weeks that followed that uh, guided my, uh, my ideas for the design of this memorial. Um, and um, I'll start with a sketch. I'm going to run through these images very quickly and not talk about all of them, but this sketch uh, was an uh, idea of a memorial that would be out in the Hudson River, that the surface of the river would be uh, torn uh, open, forming two voids, and that the water would cascade into these voids and they would never fill up. A very inexplicable image, but one that persisted in my mind. I felt the need to, uh, to unpack it and spent a year uh, sort of modeling it, sketching it, and eventually building this small sculpture uh, that I photographed on the rooftop of my apartment. And, and in it, I could see the absence of those towers in the skyline reflected in these two voids in the river. And one of the reasons I was drawn to the river is because I could not imagine uh, building on the site uh, so shortly thereafter. It's funny to think of that image of the Place de la Concorde. You know, that is where we now go as tourists and sit and enjoy a small cup of coffee, and it feels like Disneyland. But yeah. the cities carry um, the the history of violence forward. Um, and so I worked on this. This was a sort of private cathartic exercise that I completed about in 2002, <laughs> 2003, and set it aside. And I came back to it a year later, uh, following the selection of uh, Daniel Liebskin's master plan for the site. And you can see the site, the 16-acre site, the super block that was created in the 60s here. And uh, Daniel's suggestion was to take that 16-acre superblock and subdivide it into four unequal quadrants by bringing Greenwich Street back through the site, running northwest, I'm sorry, north-south, and uh, by bringing Fulton running east-west, and taking the 10 million square feet of office space which had been there before and, um, and bringing them back to the site in a series of office towers which would ring the site. The site that was open for a competition in 2003 for the design of the memorial was fairly constrained. It had to fit within the parameters of this master plan. And the master plan called for that site to be some 30 feet below street level. It suggested a large bridge building that would uh, come over the North Tower footprint in another building which would um, cantilever over the South Tower footprint as you see here. And for me, uh, one of the most problematic aspects was actually how the entire site was submerged 30 feet below street level. You could see this long ramp coming down into the site. And I thought of my own experiences in New York and how different this was. I saw something here that intentionally cut off the site from the, from the life of the city, that shielded it. Um, and uh, there's a value implicit in that move. Um, and it's not that it's wrong or right. It was different than what I saw. Uh, and I felt compelled to imagine a different memorial, uh, in part because of those experiences which I described earlier. I thought that, um, and this is something we, you know, we know on some sort of academic level, that public space is very important, but it's not until you experience it on a very emotional and visceral level, the way I had in the aftermath of that attack, that um, you understand how critical public space is to <coughs> to our functioning as a society, as a democracy, that there are so many values which are implicit within that. And I thought of my own experiences going late at night to, uh, to Washington Square and standing there at that fountain in the middle of the square at two or three in the morning. I came there by myself and there were probably a dozen or two dozen people standing there too. Um, and not a single word had to be said, no event had to be choreographed, no speeches had to be made there is a sense of connection. And in some ways, I can mark that moment for myself as a moment where I felt engaged, um, a part of this society. And standing next to others, I felt uh, an implicit sense of a collective identity that I was part of. And I thought that you know, these, these public spaces are incredibly resilient. They're powerful spaces. And uh, the suggestion that the memorial site should be cut off from the life of the city felt wrong to me. That I thought that it would actually benefit from a, a direct connection, from bringing the site up to grade, from removing these surrounding buildings from around the memorial site, and really linking directly to the life of the city, imagining many different activities occurring here side by side, uh, these activities enriching each other. 
that it's not a site that could be a site for memory or for the everyday or for the profane or for the secular, but that bringing them together um, would make any activity that would occur there more meaningful. And so I started to sketch an idea of a memorial um, that would be bounded by these four streets, by West, Greenwich, Fulton, and Liberty, uh, and those two voids which had previously been in the Hudson River, bringing them to the site. So this sort of vast, flat, urban plaza punctuated by these two voids which cut deep into its surface. And that led to my entry uh, to the competition. And that's, I don't think you can see this here, but the word I end on here is play. And for me, it was a significant thing to do that. I thought it was important to describe the site as a site for memory, but a site where you can also imagine uh, neighborhood residents coming through here with their kids, uh, or you can imagine office workers coming, crossing the street from one of these new office buildings, sitting at a park bench and uh, uh, for, for their lunch break and then going back up, and that it would be always a site of memory, but also, uh, especially as time unfolds, a site that brings other activities into it. And here you saw that the, that physical um, reconfiguring of the site, the removal of these buildings, this notion of creating an open public space. Uh, and these two voids um, that cut into the plaza are where you would encounter the names of the victims. And for me, that moment of encounter was always um, very much at the heart of that experience, that moment where you walk up to the threshold that you cannot cross. Uh, and you see this empty space that you can um, approach but not enter. And that is where you encounter the name. So it's interesting to see that image of uh, that not a single person was actually occupying the center of your image. Uh, everything was on the periphery to a different way. Um, as one of eight finalists, I was uh, selected. I came to the site. I saw that slurry wall, which I understood why Daniel Liebskin wanted to uh, to preserve as a trace of the violence that had happened on the site. I saw these cutoff columns, which to me spoke very eloquently of of what is no longer there. And in many ways, this design tries to to bring um, into awareness what is missing, what is absent. It is uh, through absence that it uh, conjures the past. Um, and I was given about a month in the budget to uh, work with uh, uh, model makers and renderers to uh, develop a more complete presentation for the jury to, uh, to decide. And here you see that descent, this arrival in this sort of cloister-like space, the view of the city mediated through this veil of water past the names. And then this is sent back up onto the Memorial Plaza. And the Memorial Plaza was always a key component of that experience, both as sort of a prologue and an epilogue to that descent uh, and ascent back to life. Um, and when I showed these images of the plaza and this model to the jury, they felt you know, that the design erred on the side of creating a site that could only function for memorial uses. They saw these images and it felt still very austere, very bleak, very much as if only a certain um, set of activities could occur within the space. And I could understand where that criticism came from and struggled uh, to find the right response in, uh, in landscaping this plaza in a way that would allow it to still function very clearly as this flat plain that is punctured by these two voids, yet at the same time has uh, a clear identity that is more uh, multivalent um, and came up with this idea that are called abacus-like bands where the trees are arrayed within these paving bands. And like beads on the wires of an abacus, trees can be placed anywhere along predetermined axes. And when you look in one direction, you see these trees sort of snap into beautiful long LAs. Then as your gaze shifts, that clarity disappears completely. And you'll see the sort of uh, informal staggering and other elements of the memorial, too. Um, I had the opportunity to show the jury, um, as one of three finalists at this point, uh, the site within its urban context. And that previous model that you saw was determined by guidelines that all eight finalists had to, um, to comply with. But it failed to show the site this, uh, within its urban context. And to me, that is such a critical part of this design. You have to understand it within, this, uh, within the realm of this urban grid of lower Manhattan, uh, streets would have, which have been there for centuries, streets which were narrow and winding when the Dutch laid them out. And over time, these enormous tall skyscrapers have grown around them. And so you come through these urban canyons onto this big open uh, plaza, this eight acre clearing in the middle of the city. And I think that space within the city um, 
is very significant. There are very few public spaces like that in, uh, in Manhattan in general and uh, in Lower Manhattan in particular. The design was selected in 2003, and I'm going to jump a little bit quickly through some of the more technical aspects of developing uh, different elements of the design to focus more on its um, place within the city. But you can see that every a item was sort of studied at length, uh, whether it was the waterfall, or whether it was the names. And um, I'm going to pause with this image for a second uh, of one of the temporary memorial pools which were built every year uh, for commemoration ceremonies at the site. And this uh, firefighter in uniform uh, captured for me the kind of uh, secular but spiritual space that I imagined. Uh, the memorial galleries would fulfill. There, that difficult moment of encounter where the names would occur within that sh sheltered, um, um, architecturally defined cloister-like space of the memorial galleries. And for a variety of reasons having to do with budget, having to do with security concerns, and having to do with the unease voiced by some family members of the victims about going below that plaza to encounter the names, uh, these memorial galleries were eliminated from the plan. And that really challenged me to, to think about how would those names be displayed now that they had to come up to plaza level. And in the sense, it upped the ante on my proposal that this plaza could serve a whole spectrum of functions. Uh, did, uh, you know, I might have said that, but could I prove that now that the names actually had to be up there? Uh, would bringing the names up to the plaza change? the plaza uh, with the, in the sense that um, you wouldn't be able to imagine any other activities going on there, or would the fact that they were up there in view of the surrounding buildings, uh, traffic, um, lessen that moment of confrontation with the names. And here I am at one of the mock-ups that we had built at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, uh, many mock-ups that we built over the next couple of years to try and find uh, that uh, architectural solution that would uh, allow those names to uh, to inhabit that space at plaza level and still create a very powerful moment of encounter as you come up to the edge of the voids. So one idea was to end the plaza, begin this water surface, and then that cascades down into the void. And the only thing breaking the surface of the water are the names forming a ring around that void. Um, another idea was to create this sort of bronze-like vessel that would ring the void and water would well out of the top of it. Uh, rivulets come falling onto one side across the names and a torrent of water falling onto the other side into the void, something that whispered in one direction and, and shouted in the other. Um, and these are just two ideas of literally dozens and dozens of ideas which we explored over that period of time uh, from 2006 through 2008 before coming settling on a solution which you see on the memorial today. And I think all of these solutions uh, uh, all of these investigations fed into the solution that you see there today, and um, uh, it affirms my belief uh, that you know design is very much a process that you begin with a very clear direction, but that direction is uh, is a compass uh, to to that ship that is going to travel through unexpected waters. And for me, the, there was always a, a clarity about the the character of the design that uh, I fought um, firmly to preserve over the course of that period of time. It was about that sort of stoic defiance uh, mixed with compassion that I encountered myself in those public spaces of New York, the way that the city came together not with a sort of a shrill um, militancy or a centered cowardness, but instead sort of with a, a stoicism, which I found incredible and that I couldn't have imagined. Uh, a stoicism leavened with compassion. It was not a uncaring, but it was deeply caring, but not willing to to resort to uh, to hysteria. Um, and so the design that you see today is this eight foot wide water table that is two feet high, and floating above it uh, are the names of the victims, and they are in, incised into this half inch thick bronze panel, this wing like form. Uh, during the day, these names appear as shadows. They're about the removal of that material. Uh, and at night, the, these panels are illuminated from within and they appear as light. Um, 
If I had to say that one issue was the most difficult issue to deal with in the design of this memorial, it, ha it would be the arrangement of the names of the victims. It was the issue that everybody uh, felt strongly about, especially people who lost loved ones, and uh, there was no uh, a clear agreement on it for, uh, for a very long time. And it was the issue that galvanized the most opposition to the, uh, to the memorial uh, over a very long period of time and essentially stopped fundraising for it in its tracks for a couple of years. Um, and it was an issue that I had no idea how I would solve when I s proposed my design. <laughs> Um, and so one of the first questions I had was the recognition of first responders. Uh, how would that occur? How do you recognize those that rushed into the towers uh, and died in an effort to save others? Um, and I said, and do so in a way that does not create a hierarchical listing, a, a sort of a wall of heroes on one side and a listing of everybody else on the other side, which some people called for. And I suggested this idea of an insignia that would be placed next to some names that would be very much in the character of and the materiality and the scale of the names themselves. Um, and that was seen as too much by many people and far too little by others who felt it should be much more explicit, that it should list rank and unit and be set aside from the other names. Um, and the next question was, how would the names be arranged? And we had close to 3,000 names and uh, the question of how they would be arranged was very political, very fraught with meaning. Um, and my initial suggestion in 2004, when the design was selected, was something that I called meaningful adjacency, that there would be a reason why one name is next to another. And that would come out of actually reaching out to close to 3,000 families and asking them if there are names of other people who are uh, also listed on this memorial that they would like to see listed next to the person that they lost. And uh, when I suggested that to the LMDC that ran the, the design at the time, um, this idea was rejected outright as being uh, impossible to implement, that it would be too logistically complex that reaching out to so many people, um, I'm not going to do that, but somebody else can and appreciate it. Um, we're losing power here. Um, you're not here. Um, so um, <laughs> we're losing drift here. Um, so this idea of meaningful adjacency would give everybody, uh, so, so, to say, so to speak, an equal footing to influence uh, the placement of a, name, of a name on the design and give each uh, family an opportunity to bring deep personal meaning into the design so that family members who perish together, friends, coworkers, could be listed next to each other. Um, and if you think of other ways of arranging the names, the most obvious being alphabetic, uh, those would not work for a variety of reasons. Uh, they might they unintentionally privilege some over others. So for example, if you share the same last name with your spouse, uh, those names would be set side by side, yet others would not have that uh, privilege, so to speak. Um, we had uh, people that share the same name. We had two Michael Francis Lynches, uh, and I imagine their family members coming to the memorial and seeing those names listed side by side and not being able to, to say with any sort of uh, affirmative sense which name uh, on the memorial belonged to them. And so uh, this idea of meaningful adjacency could address that, but it was rejected. And in, fa in its place, the, uh, the other solution I proposed was a truly random listing of the names, a haphazard listing. We would pull names out of a hat, so to speak, one by one and list them on the memorial. And that felt very, uh, very brutal uh, to suggest something like that because it would separate people who I felt and I'm sure many other people felt should be listed next to each other on the memorial. But uh, any other sorting mechanism was unfair for other reasons, and, um, and that felt more wrong. Um, so for two years, we had this idea of a haphazard listing of the names, which uh, irritated and galvanized family groups into coming up with a counter proposal, which you see at the top here, uh, where people would be listed by the company that they worked for. And the company that they worked for, um, you'll have to take the my word on the rest of the slides. Um, the company that they worked for would be listed uh, alphabetically. They would be listed alphabetically within that company. Their age would be listed um, and the floor on which they uh, worked. And I felt that what that did, it took this idea of giving each individual name a place on the memorial that was its own. Uh, it reduced it to a list um, of something that 
came very close to looking like a building directory almost. And, uh, and it took the, the emphasis on the, on the individual and the universal, uh, what gave each individual name its place around the memorial, but also within this ribbon of names which would ring each void, and shifted that focus to the smaller and smaller groups based upon employer and place of, uh, of work. And uh, in 2006, when Mayor Bloomberg became chairman of the Memorial Foundation, this was the first issue he wanted to tackle you know, because it was essentially forming a roadblock to the development of every other aspect of the memorial. And I met with him uh, for a couple of hours. Uh, the mayor is a very data-driven guy. He had a number of suggestions and questions. And what came out of that meeting was a proposal to um, to arrange the names in nine group, nine broad groups, which would be based on geography, where people were that day. So you had the four flights, the two towers in the Pentagon, the 93 bombing victims which died near the North Tower footprint, and the first responders, and the first responders in turn organized by where they came from, from the same firehouse, from the same precinct building. But within these groups, uh, and some of these groups have over a thousand names in them, the names would appear to be arranged um, randomly, but in fact would be linked by that idea of meaningful adjacency. And I'm still kind of amazed that um, somebody in political office would take that risk of an unknown, of reaching out to 3,000 families uh, without knowing if their requests could be honored or not. And uh, uh, finally, in 2009, letters went out to family members asking them to participate in this process, and we got over 1,200 requests for adjacency from family members. And it's sort of beware of what you wish for. Now we had to take all this information and actually synthesize it into something that looked coherent so that even if you weren't aware of these sort of hidden connections, um, as you walked around the memorial, uh, there, was, there would not be a sort of a sense of fragmentation of why is there why are some names next to each other? Why are there breaks where there shouldn't be breaks? And so it was an exercise that had sort of a pure visual graphic component to it and a hidden uh, meaningful component to it. And some of these requests that came out of that process uh, were incredibly um, difficult and emotional. Um, one of the requests we got was from a young woman who lost her best friend from college and her father. Her father was on flight 11. Her best friend was working in the North Tower. And that flight crashed into the North Tower. And we were able to list his name at the end of Flight 11, her name at the beginning of World Trade Center. And you might not be aware of that when you walk by those names. Uh, there is no uh, clear connection there. But there's a way to share that information once it's embedded into the fabric of the memorial. Uh, and uh, it's starting to happen already. It can happen through printed brochures, through audio guides, through video guides. But what was important for me was to put that meaning in there and let it be teased out over time by different means and different people. Um, and you know, we spent over a year uh, working on this. We approached it in a very high-tech, low-tech kind of way. We did one pool entirely by hand with index cards that had information on them about which names should be adjacent to which. And uh, at the North Pool, we worked with a group called Local Projects. Uh, the uh, they created a computer algorithm that allowed us to actively move names, uh, sort of drag and drop them from panel to panel, and there you go, perfect. Um, and, um, and so we were able to complete this, and at the end of the day we were able to meet each and every adjacency request, which to me was one of the most gratifying moments of working on this design, something that um, might be invisible to many people, but at the end of the day, this process determined the placement of each and every name. Even when we weren't asked uh, for an adjacency request, we tried to keep people within uh, groups that were close to their coworkers, and you started to get these strings of connections that went from panel to panel to panel. I'm going to jump over the whole issue of handicap accessibility and how it changed the corner, um, because I think I'm running out of time, and show you a few images of the process of testing and assembly and, materi and materials, um, only to wrap up with, uh, you know, this return to where it started for me in some sense, this idea of um, reflecting on the past, creating a place for us to gather, making what is no longer here visible in the minds of visitor visitors and show you a few images from the opening day uh, where, you know, I feel that what we did is we sort of built half of the memorial and the other half is the public coming there and uh, making this place come to life. It's as if we built the stage 
stage set, but it is uh, for the actors, uh, us in our everyday, to come here together and uh, make it come um, to life and to meaning. And you know, these, this image was taken on the day that it opened, um, uh, just steps away from, from this. So thank you. Um, I would like to um, explain a little bit before I start that um, my presentation today is uh, probably not a project that is going to be realized in my lifetime. <coughs> it's definitely the process and uh, <coughs> it has a more of a provocative, it's uh, objective. It's actually its aim is to uh, make a kind of wake-up call when it comes to existing uh, war memorials, historical war memorials. They're already built in the middle of, in between of which we are all living. In fact, uh, myself, I'm coming from the country where there is a saying that uh, somewhere between war memorials there is Poland. <laughs> so, and but <coughs> looking at, uh, at this image, uh, this is the end of First World War, 1918 uh, parade. It's clear that uh, what Walter Benjamin said, that the way in which the past is honored as heritage is more disastrous than its simple disappearance could ever be. This uh, remark uh, by Benjamin is certainly valid when it comes to war memorials, especially to victory uh, arches. When uh, I look at this arch, I start thinking that it looks like the ghost and the desire for the lost body, perhaps of the lost head of the powerful king, a democratic void the king has a democratic void, speaking like Claude Lefort, that manifests itself in the tyranny of the actual void of the triumphal arch, through which the emperor, in our secret wish, is to return and stage again victorious uh, war and suspend all inconvenient freedoms and rights in the name of national security and unity and make uh, finally an orderly peace once for all. Well, of course, uh, <coughs> it was built during the royal time, but we uh, definitely are cherishing this memorial. And it's very interesting uh, how many people are visiting it and how much it is a part of uh, our life. So through uh, those memorials, uh, hypnotic aesthetic appearance and symbolic impact, the way they are honored, the war memorials dangerously consolidate in us the idea of service in war 
as our moral and sacred duty, noble sacrifice, or martyrdom. martyrdom. And most importantly, however, they do nothing to end the war. Aesthetically and symbolically, they are in fact cursing away any efforts to analyze and critically challenge such uh, ideas and to stop the perpetuation of those ideas. So, uh, to preserve, protect, disseminate, perpetuate, and impose such ideas on us <laughs> is their job, but there's something as something eternal, above and beyond all freedoms and rights. So, uh, also when it comes to public space, and in fact public domain, I have to bring this uh, more recent thoughts on this topic by uh, Martin Heyer and Arnold Reindorp. They see democratic space called, it's called by them new public domain, as one based on uh, Immanuel Kant's assumption that ability of, of making one's own intelligent judgment, important democratic and enlightenment principle, is always based on exchange with others. And judging is not an application of received norms, as those inscribed in triumphal arches, for example. Judging is a process of uh, to beware of one's own values. The legendary Kantian call to use your own reason uh, is to means to do so in exchange with others. So it is uh, in confrontation with other opinions that we deliver our ideas and choose to uphold or not. So Martin Heyer says that such action and process, agonistic I guess, speaking like Chantal Mouffe, would like develops, uh, it's developing also in cultural confrontation with different meaning associated with the same physical and symbolic urban space, which is important for developing social intelligence and formation of one's judgment. So what I'm trying to say that, yes, there are peace institutes, there are various organizations and actions taking place all over. But they are far away from those symbolic war machines. And it would be interesting, in fact, if they join each other. In fact, from a Peace Institute in Washington that we visited with students uh, uh, a long time ago, you could see uh, Lincoln Memorial, which is a sort of war memorial, repressed war memorial. So. War memorials should be equipped, in fact, uh, special and me in terms of media, of to, for us to form our judgments on their own symbolic grounds and territories. Uh, in fact, by the way, the real triumph, in Kant's view, would be an achievement in perpetual peace. So Benjamin also said that the official past is composed of history of the victors that celebrates and triumph uh, the triumph of the strongest and the disappearance of the weakest. Well, we can of course see here how uh, was the scale of this monument. It's tremendous. Those people above are smaller than the ornamental sculptures free in the long frames. And of course, you can see here um, how much of the seductive architectural artistry is, uh, is there. So, it's clear that the triumph of the strongest here is, is the issue, but also celebration of the leader. And in fact, there's a whole concept here of achieving peace through war that one has to walk through and come to that conclusion that the only way to have peace is through war. But in fact, war is a sanctioned collective madness. Conducted with nuclear weapons, it leads humanity to global annihilation. The culture of war idealizes war and orchestrates a kind of war psychosis. So in fact, uh, the war permits us to act uh, in a way in which if, if, uh, if we were acting like this in the peacetime, we would be in mental hospitals or in prisons. <coughs> this uh, La Patrie is definitely calling for this kind of, uh, uh, kind of madness. Also, the naked youth 
the myth of, uh, of young martyr, born to die, That's the, the way I was brought up, by the way, in my <laughs> old country. I was born to die for my country, for the lost love object, as psychoanalysis would say, the nation or the leader. <coughs> so um, here we are, the naked German youth, uh, French youth is ready to depart war against the uh, Prussian, uh, uh, Prussian army. And another important thing, this monument, among many other things, is reinforcing the, the, the notion of, of uh, masochism, war masochism, the pleasure of dying for the country and for the leader. And in fact, one of the, the, the head of a Napoleonic guard, when the Napoleon was saying goodbye to his troops in Versailles, said, uh, sir, we shall no longer have the pleasure of dying for you. Of course, we see uh, another thing, is that uh, the national culture, uh, it's the kind of in triumphal arches especially, is a symbolic narrative that based on this history that is hermeneutic, as, uh, 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 as Levinas would say, it has a magical character because it's forgetting some events and facts while remembering other and taking charge of the interpretation. So this is what we are photographing here. Not only what is there, but what is not there, which is very important. What is not there could be just a huge, amount of uh, uh, facts, events, that are not inscribed there, that could completely alter our relation to war and our readiness to, to, to join it. So here, of course, there are telescopic uh, in equipments. Those memorials are equipped already, but in a very different direction than I would like them to be equipped. They are equipped inside, in fact, there is a slideshow and a big map, interact, no, responsive map, which allows people to trace all of the other memorial arches that are born of this one. So uh, there are hundreds of them. They are so smaller than this one, except one in India. So you could actually see it's a mother of all of the modern triumphal arches. And also, it's the first uh, eternal, modern eternal flame which is uh, after the, the, to commemorate unknown soldier of the war that was to, supposed to be the last war, the First World War. So this uh, also creates a kind of uh, <coughs> desire on my part to start with this particular monument, uh, being a mother of all uh, triumphal arches, uh, with a provocative project that hopefully will disseminate and embrace more and more of those uh, uh, war memorials. But in democratic society, we should be building a war-free civilization that demand, de demands dismantling the culture of war by exposing the false image of war, unmasking the process of making, staging, commemorating, confronting our misguiding willingness to join war and revealing the real toll of war, psychological, social, economic, environmental, and ethical. It would be much more difficult for young people to sign up for so-called peace missions or any other war adventures. So it's also important to disseminate a new positive attitude and provide conditions for proactive commitment as well as developing and implementing opportunities, innovating methodologies, and effective projects for practical engagement in peacemaking. This type of uh, activity, of course, should be even protected here by the very democratic uh, uh, order that in our country is based on First Amendment. Give us the right, and even by implication obligation, to pursue an assertion of such right to form a free, open communication expression also of our memorials and histories towards the new public domain. So in this uh, presentation I will show, I'm trying to propose a kind of 
unwar architecture, the transformation of war memorials into unwar memorials, by adding to them special functional programs, new media, environments, new spatial symbolic structures, new projects that will be supplementary to their existing symbolic and commemorating forms of operation. But it's also important to say about this Napoleonic War. It, was, it mobilized one and a half million people through conscription. It was the first time in world history the army of excess of one million had been mobilized. So the total mobilization of nation in arms resulted in estimated four million deaths. The Arcade Triumph, in fact, is legitimizing market of subsequent wars and conflict and worldwide dissemination of those arches, but also 122 major wars, plus a similar number of deadly conflicts in 19th century, which caused more than 45 million deaths. 120 conflicts, wars in the 20th century, with 160 million deaths and 22 deadly conflicts plus 15 major bloody civil unrest during the just first decade of 21st century. So those facts should also be elaborated in, in very close connection with the very body of this kind of symbolic war machine seen by masses of people, children included, school tours. It's part of a, we used to be family photographic albums, now home videos, you know, and all of those very uh, personal uh, uh, memories of uh, tourist, uh, tourist memorabilia. So the, this, the primary goal of this Art de Triomphe, uh, World Institute for the Abolition of, of War, is to actually encompass this structure uh, into uh, some kind of and war uh, machine. So, <coughs> of course, uh, here I am, uh, becoming <coughs> more and more of a designer and uh, trying to turn students into more and more of artists. <laughs> and it seems to be my continuing project. But this is the very beginning of my uh, new life. A very fresh, I'm really embarrassed to show it in the uh, uh, Graduate School of Design. Um, but still, take it as the process, the beginning of one process, please. So you have uh, in the top section of the structure the various programs that are into uh, unwar future. And around, there are various displays that they belong, they help people to come closer to, uh, to the uh, whole iconography, the iconic uh, symbolic uh, kind of or ornamentation uh, of a narrative of this uh, uh, memorial. <coughs> now, I presented this in, in Paris in some small exhibition, and uh, one of the curators from Saint Pompidou came and said, well, can this be built? I said, well, if you could build Saint Pompidou, I mean, you can build this. <laughs> <laughs> it even looks similar. <laughs> so. I oh, know, I felt tower. When I say that, will this be permanent or temporary? I say, I felt tower. Is temporary. <laughs> so, its temporary character might in fact sustain its long-lasting life. So, this is the very kind of first uh, attempt to, uh, to visualize this, this, this to have a scaffolding-like structure, which is even more fashionable recently among architects to refer to scaffolding and to artists. But I have a special reason for it, because it is, should be a little bit like in treating this Arc de Triomphe as a kind of animal or some kind of specimen that is, un, uh, is under the process of examination, continuing examination, and close eye to eye, side by side contact. So the big freeze, 
uh, could be the continuing strip of media display panels with all recorded war campaigns, battles, assaults on civilians with lists of their direct and indirect human casualties, related material, culture, and psychosocial losses. So it could be platforms that would be uh, moving uh, horizontally, but they're also vertical platforms. They're removing all those names of generals and other uh, inscriptions. Uh, so, similarly, the parallel to each relief that honors Napoleonic battle, there will be listing of all killed, injured soldiers. Those are the, the missing information. But of course, at the top, there will be lots of work that will be proactive, will be transformative work, and help people to engage in peace-related projects, especially young people, rather than joining this. I mean, they can join something else. But in fact, opposite, but in fact, artists too, to be art and cultural projects. For hundreds of years, artists and architects contributed to the culture of war. The masses of various special structures, war, movies and literature and paintings and armament and war games uh, and computer war games and so forth. So why not the opposite, doing the opposite. Since we are so good in making culture of war, why not making culture of unwar? So, it was inside a very basic kind of way of presenting possibility of various informational panels that are uh, an alternative narrative to what's there. It could be all sorts of uh, information that, in fact, uh, people don't know. People don't know how many times and how many people averted the war. There's no monuments to those who averted the war. So that's another interesting thing. Uh, consider on the top floor some kind of forum in which in a kind of agonistic memory fashion, people will argue over the various ways to uh, do to unwar our cultures and also to engage in various projects. Uh, of course, you will see Paris from this, <laughs> like Eiffel Tower. And also, <coughs> we'll come very close. <coughs> Close public examination of the visual symbols of Arc de Triomphe will be inspired and added by special kind of platforms. So um, as if uh, with magnifying glass and by forensic study, the aesthetic secrets and propaganda craft of war making symbolism of this and other war memorials will be publicly disclosed. So it's important to be close. In fact, one way to, to handle enemy or, or adversary as well is to come very close. When you come very close, you have no, uh, you are kind of disarming yourself and, and others. You're too close to fight, but it's important to recognize. It's not, not always talking about peace. Let's talk about war. Let's figure out what it is, how to undo the war. So. There are other projects of this sort, and uh, uh, I like to end, actually my presentation, I don't want to go over time, uh, <laughs> and just to show uh, the landscape at night. Um, and again, the structure itself. And the naked <laughs> man. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Christoph, would you join us? So, please, yes. 
uh, there is a, there is a question at the rear here. Uh, there is a question here. Um, in fact, these are almost two questions, uh, one from um, Michael and one for Christoph. The first question for Michael is if you ever thought about, I'm sure you have, about how these names are to some degree, I'm sure they're necessary, but there are um, a way of inscribing a, a rather abstract memorial with a certain con concreteness. Yet, over time, when the family members pass away, these names also become abstract. And then what do they mean? Was there ever um, a consider consideration of having these names more temporary or um, thinking how they would be able to change? And uh, Christoph, I have a qu question. I was really intrigued by um, the fact that the uh, obscuring this on monument and it almost, it, it changes it from, it becomes a different landmark. It's almost looks a bit like a scar in the in the city right now and bringing the um, visitor very close I had the feeling that the way you presented it almost becomes like a filmic narrative where people w walk past these stories um, and animate these stories um, and almost edit their own story um, so I was wondering if you ever thought about how you would orchestrate the uh, movement through a space in which you're aware of all the alternative stories that uh, one could create. Thank you. I think I'll go first. Um, to me, the name was the sort of the most uh, irreducible essence of um, of conveying humanity. It's a sort of something that we we grow into. That when it changes in our lives, it's for a very significant reason, and I think that persists. And yeah. Names go back millennia. A lot of the names that uh, you see on that memorial are names that have been around for a very long time, not these particular individuals, but our connection to them. So uh, to me, it was important to, to tie this to, to the death uh, of, of individuals, that, this was, you know, that there's a concreteness to it, that it's something that we can relate to individually. Uh, and I think future generations will be able to do that as well. So? I was, I was, yeah, this is the process, but in fact, I put some thoughts already into potential direction of, uh, of this uh, <coughs> alternative uh, uh, tour or visitation of the memorial. I think that <coughs> it should definitely be a discursive process. It should be armed with enough media to allow people to share their various comments, responses, and also <coughs> share them with uh, those who've been studying it and who have things to say about it from the point of view of uh, uh, theory of ideology or anthropology or kind of war studies and so forth. I think this should be very thick, complex uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, discourse, but definitely in <coughs> close contact. With, uh, with the memorial's uh, narrative. Okay. George, and then back. George? Can we, mostly, yes. Mostly. Wait for the mic, two yeah. seconds. <coughs> Thank you. This is mostly for Michael Arad, but a little bit to Christoph Vodichko. I, I mean, I've been very, I mean, Maya Lin is gonna go down in history if for nothing else than the concept of individual names. And, um, and in that sense, your memorial, Michael, is clearly a child of hers. Um, it, not only a child, but in that respect, surely so. And I'm just, and the, the, the phenomenon, and given the, the, the kind of somewhat deconstructive kind of tenor of Christoph's presentation um, of a kind of alternative model of memorial to the one which you did, um, I'm just, it, it, it's hard for me to imagine any longer that one could have a, a, mo a, a modern or contemporary memorial in our world 
that did not have individual names. The trope has become so powerful. I mean, I'd be just interested in comment on that. Yeah, I admire uh, Myelin's work, but I actually think the, the focus on individual names goes back much further than that. If you look at you know every uh, small town in America had their war memorials, which were erected after World War One, and they listed the names uh, of the dead. So I think. Uh, what is interesting about Myelin's memorial is how it reduced it to, uh, it erased everything else but that. Uh, but the focus on the names, on the individual sacrifice, and, and recognizing it in war memorials, I think, has been there for, for quite a long time. It's interesting, though, because it's certainly not there. It's not there in the French Revolution. We are really in, in the realm that's not on I was just going to say that, interestingly, um, it's not there in the French Revolution. And it does seem to be a kind of modern uh, preoccupation in, in many ways. And I think that the swinging between the particular and the abstract has to do with historical specificities that need to be underscored. Interestingly, also, I was thinking that the Arc de Triomphe, there is an unknown soldier. You know, the core of the memorial is actually not the arch. It's actually the grave of the unknown soldier of World War I, who has no name by definition. Mm -hmm. But I, I'll pass it to, yeah. to the rear and then Richard. This uh, question is uh, for Michael. Um, the development of uh, memorials is oftentimes very complicated. Vietnam War Memorial, more recently the World War II Memorial in, in DC, um, oftentimes involves so many different stakeholders that it hamstrings the process of the designer. Uh, and oftentimes stakeholders don't understand uh, the vision of a designer until it's fully expressed. Uh, can you say a little bit about how you balanced interacting with important stakeholders but also maintaining the integrity of your design vision? Uh, it might be fully understood and not embraced, too, uh, the vision. Um, for me, I mean, and I didn't talk at length about it, but there were certainly points in the process of the design which felt as if the design w could have easily uh, been sidetracked into a new uh, direction, into something altogether different. Um, and I think as a young designer, and I started this process when I was 36, um, there was a tremendous fear uh, at first that uh, once it goes off of the sort of the physical aspects of the memorial, which I had grown to know and in a sense uh, carried within them the idea of the memorial, how would that idea persist in a new form? And uh, it was with great reluctance and apprehension that those changes, when they were forced upon the design, um, that I had to contend with them. And uh, in particular, that moment when the memorial galleries uh, were eliminated from the design, I, I truly was uncertain if we would be able to maintain the character of the memorial moving forward. And I think we have. Uh, not, and I'm not saying this to be sort of glib uh, and Pollyannish about it, um, but <coughs> if you think about the, this idea of a memorial that would carry that sort of quiet defiance forward, not become something that is bellicose, not become something that is hysterical or self-pitying, but something that it is um, that was very similar in its tone, in its character to what we had there at the beginning uh, in that conception of what this memorial might be. It was only through that sort of the active engagement in the process of not walking away from it, of advocating for it ceaselessly, of trying to build support for it. And I was fortunate to have people within the Bloomberg administration who cared deeply about this project, people like Amanda Burden, our city planner, people like Kate Levin, our cultural commissioner, that were the mayor's eyes and ears, so to speak, in the day-to-day -day operation of the project. But I also know that we sort of navigated a very fine line, a knife's edge, that at any moment we could have slipped off it and this could have become something different. And there were many competing uh, proposals for the design throughout the process uh, from uh, my colleagues, from our uh, associate <laughs> architect, from our landscape Might architect, from colleagues. many, yes. So, um, you know, it's about um, not giving up, but also understanding that there are new constraints and how do you move forward? One thing I didn't talk about was, for example, late in the game, the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities approached us and said this design does not meet our needs, and I was thinking about that when I was looking at you, your project. Um, and they said when you're seated, you can't see that void at the center of each 
And uh, how can you change the design to do that? And that came along very late in the game, and there were a lot of bad proposals that were made immediately. Could you put scissor lifts on the Memorial Plaza that would go up and down? Could you put gaps between the panels so you could see through them? Could you change the bronze to glass so it, it would be transparent? And the way we solved that problem at the end of the day was to chamfer the corners, which brought viewers closer into the edge of the memorial, which allowed you to be seated in a wheelchair and still see that void at the center. And I think in many ways that actually improved the design. It made the, des the corner uh, more articulated sculpturally. It allowed us to carry the names in a closed ribbon around the entire perimeter rather than stopping at the corner and starting again. Um, so it added uh, to the poetic intent, to the sculptural resolution. Um, but it came from that continuous engagement of having a clear idea of what the design is and letting that idea guide its physical manifestation. Thank you. Richard, and then Liz. Uh, I wanted to ask, <laughs> I wanted to ask you, Erica, about um, uh, these, as in the trashing of the aristocratic house, these are the total theater. Yes. But they're also uh, momentary. They're, uh, they have no durability in time. Uh, was that an issue for people um, that, it, you know, that they, that in a way these are theatrical gestures, uh, but they're not sustained. They're not sustained, uh, and yet they're repeated. It's interesting, the first one that I showed you is tied to a specific event. It was, it was the result of a duel between an aristocrat and a Republican, and the Republican was uh, uh, wounded. And it's one of the few events of this sort where we can there's enough information to know that a so-called mob appeared. What happens in the iconography of, of this kind of image is that uh, the mob appears actually as a stand-in for what are official actions, um, which is very interesting because it speaks to the ways in which um, that image of the people in action is part <coughs> of a troubled mythography of the state itself. Um, so although these are gestures that are ephemeral or repeated or kind of, you know, flash fire events across urban space, they also feed into a broader and <laughs> far more kind of robust uh, false mythology propagated by the government. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Your interior square, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, we'll have, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, Liz, you'll have the last yes, question. Okay. I have a question also for Erica. <coughs> I was very struck by your um, dichotomy of the, the female uh, figure being representing the motherland, the nation, the Marianne, and then the male, Demos, the citizen. And I wondered if you might have more to say about how that dichotomy translates into the material world, um, it, whether it's public space, whether it's you know, memorial building, are there, d do spaces devoted to culture um, and uh, look different than spaces devoted to political participation? Uh, and I, and I, I wonder if you might even have some observations about Christophe's, um, you know, pl uh, plans for the Arc de Triomphe, because in some ways that is, the Arc represents the kind of, uh, the state project of war um, in a very official way, and some of his critique of that is to bring in the unwar and perhaps the nation in a broader sense. Right. Uh, so I just wondered if you could reflect a little more uh, on that's that. That's a great question, and I'm not going to be able to answer it fully, um, but several thoughts come to mind. Um, the, the first has to do with the interesting declining status of women during the French Revolution. Um, and Lynn Hunt has done extraordinary work about this. It's clear that the trial of Marie Antoinette was the trial of women. Uh, what, what, what is a woman? Uh, and she is not a woman, she's a monster because she meddled in political affairs, because she was a foreigner, she was not French, you know, this sort of thing. Um, and after she was executed, political clubs actually closed their doors to women. Um, on the other hand, and this actually links up a little bit to your project in a way that the, the, the image that resurges is a Rousseauist vision of palliative nature. Um, so for example, in that mountain uh, at Saint-Denis, it was part of a ritual transference of Rousseau's ashes ultimately to the Pantheon, and there's a, just a, a 
hilarious and ridiculous description of the chariot which was carrying women uh, who were nursing babies and exposing their breasts to the public sphere. So there's a very sort of strange and tense dichotomy, um, a gendered dichotomy um, there. But I think the, the, the sort of ambience of nature as a kind of eternal palliative is operating in particular ways very, very differently from yours, but nonetheless is being uh, uh, kind of um, unleashed in, in this context. Just to finish on a very trivial note, let's not forget also that the Doric is supposed to be masculine and the Ionic is feminine and is usually used for the monuments of culture. And on that final Vitruvian note, I would like to mm -hmm. thank again all three speakers. For <laughs>